me. I'm Michael Nockley, the Golden School, and it's a really great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the seventh annual Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Health Lecture. And when you go into a fine restaurant, the waiter talks about the signature dishes. And this is one of our signature dishes. Um, the Goldman School is very proud of the Rhoda Goldman Lecture Series, which we started a number of years ago with the noted cardiologist Michael DeBakey, and have followed up with uh, major events concerning Medicare, the marriage and divorce of UCSF and Stanford Medical School, uh, problems of food and obesity, uh, in, uh, communicable diseases, and managed care. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this because the Goldman School and the university as a community is interested in teaching, research, and public outreach to stimulate debate on the most pressing contemporary issues of our time. Our school has been a lucky uh, recipient of major support from the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Fund. So let me say a word about that fund and about Richard and Rhoda Goldman. Richard and Rhoda Goldman are both graduates of this university, married after the Second World War, and started the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Fund in 1951. And they have supported an, an extraordinary number of admirable organizations, institutions, and activities. Uh, Rhoda Goldman herself was involved in a large number of environmental and also health-related uh, activities. She was the president of the board of directors of the Mount Zion Hospital and Medical Center. She was a chairwoman of then Mayor Dianne Feinstein's committee to erect a memorial for six million victims of the Holocaust. She was a key figure in, she co-founded the San Francisco Reach for Recovery program in the late 60s, an organization that offers peer-to-peer -peer counseling and support for women after their surgery for breast cancer. And she became a chairperson of the Stern Grove Festival Association that oversees these wonderful summertime cultural performances in San Francisco, an activity that is carried on today by uh, Richard and Rhoda's son, Doug, also a Cal grad, who's here tonight. The Goldman Fund supported and does support uh, not only an extraordinary number of activities, but really became world famous for its establishment of the Goldman Environmental Prize, which was started in 1990 by Richard and Rhoda Goldman. And even if you haven't been paying too much attention, you must have realized that just recently, one of the early recipients of the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Environmental Prize, Wangari Matai, was just awarded the Nobel Peace Prize just this past fall. She's the first woman from Africa ever to receive this prize, and just a wonderful individual for her work in environmental activism. So you're really talking about two people, Richard and Rhoda, who've been actively involved in making the lives of all of us better for more than 50 years, and I think they deserve a round of applause. Welcome, everybody. Congratulations on willing to risk a little dampness to be here tonight. Uh, I'm just going to take a few moments to give you a few ref reflections on Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. I've known him for many years, and I regret that I didn't know his father, but from all those that knew them both, they tell me he is the spitting image, as you will see tonight. Uh, Bobby's been supportive of our prize from the very beginning. In fact, we were in New York with the winners some 15 plus years ago. And he spoke to the group on that occasion, among other people who did. Uh, I've often told him that, uh, and you can judge for yourselves, but if I know of any younger person uh, who is of presidential caliber, he's number one on my list 
I'm not, I'm not promoting anything. I'm just saying he has the... <laughs> I'm just letting you know that I think he has those qualifications. Um, if you've been following the news about him, he did something quite amazing recently. He turned down the opportunity to run for Attorney General of the State of New York because he wants to be with his family of six children during their youth. And it's a very commendable position, and I think we should all recognize it. I know that uh, as we're meeting tonight, that Rhoda's smiling because she knew Bobby, she respected him, and it's a wonderful choice of the school to have him speak tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. It's now my very special pleasure to introduce Robert Kennedy, Jr. This is actually the second time within this uh, past year that I've had the pleasure of introducing him. Last time was in my role as president of the University of Toronto. In fact, if I change presidencies often enough, I may get to introduce him every year. <laughs> and I can tell you that in Canada, uh, because of uh, heroic work he did in helping Canadian indigenous people negotiate treaties protecting their traditional homelands that he's absolutely a national hero in Canada, uh, perhaps the most admired American in Canada, but frankly, in the current climate, perhaps the only American. <laughs> I got a hard time last time when I introduced Al Gore for being too partisan, so I'm going to try and control myself now. Uh, a longtime defender of the environment, Mr. Kennedy was named one of Time Magazine's heroes for the planet, in quotation marks, for helping Riverkeeper fight to restore the Hudson River. This group's achievement helped create more than 125 waterkeeper organizations across the globe. Mr. Kennedy is a senior attorney with the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, president of the Waterkeeper Alliance grassroots organization, and chief prosecuting attorney for the Hudson River Keeper Group. He's worked on environmental issues across America, and part of what I mentioned already, he's assisted several indigenous peoples in Latin America and Canada, helping them negotiate treaties protecting their traditional homelands. Mr. Kennedy has published several books, including the New York Times bestseller, Crimes Against Nature, which was published in 2004, and The River Keepers, published in 1997 with John Cronin. Please welcome Robert Kennedy, Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Berg, no, for those, that, that, uh, those wonderful words. I want to start by apologizing for my voice, which I hope will warm up as we, um, as we proceed uh, to say how honored I am uh, to, to be here at, uh, at the Goldman School and at Berkeley and also by the presence of one of my heroes, Robert Reich, who's the former Secretary of Labor. And of course, Richard Goldman, and I, 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 I'm very, very flattered by that endorsement from Mr. Goldman, particularly since he's a lifelong Republican. And, um, but he's the good kind of Republican before they, before they took the conserve out of conservatism. Um, and, uh, you know, Richard, Dick Goldman is one of my heroes, and I've always said this about him because, and it's so ironic given his, his background, but he was really one of the first people to recognize that, uh, that environmental issues are always human rights issues. They are always, and that, the, the, uh, and that they're the best measure 
of how a democracy is functioning, of the success of a democracy, is how it distributes the goods of the land, whether it maintains the public commons, the public trust assets in the hands of all the people, or whether it allows those things to be concentrated and stolen from the people by large aggregations of, of wealth and power. And that's really all that environmental issues are about. It's a struggle for democracy to maintain the uh, ownership of the public trust in the hands of the people versus uh, letting it to accrue to corporate power. And he was in, you know, of course, people are ground up and spit out by, by powerful interests in that process, people who stand up for those rights. And Richard Goldman was the first guy to really recognize that. And his prize has such international prestige, it's known as the Nobel Prize of, of the Environment. But it's really, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize should be called the Goldman Prize of everything else because uh, what he does is so important. And uh, I think people are beginning more and more to, to recognize that. Um, and Chancellor Bergno, uh, I mentioned my book. And, you know, the book is, is about, it's not really about the environment. It's about, it's about the, uh, the, the corrosive impact of excessive corporate power on American democracy. And that's really what I'm going to talk about tonight. And it's not, it's not about uh, a Democrat attacking a Republican. It, the book, I would say, is nonpartisan because I, although I attack President Bush because he's got a very bad record on the environment, I'm not attacking him because he's a Republican and I've supported Republicans all over the country. I've been, I have been disciplined over 20 years as an environmental advocate about being nonpartisan and bipartisan in my approach to these issues. I don't think there's any such thing as Republican children or Democratic children. I think the worst thing that can happen to the environment is it becomes the province of a single political party. But you can't talk honestly about the environment today in any context without speaking critically of this administration. This is the worst environmental president that we've had in American history. If you look at NRDC's website, you will see over 400 major environmental rollbacks that have been promoted or implemented by this administration over the last four years as part of a deliberate concerted effort to eviscerate 30 years of environmental law. It's a stealth attack. The administration knowing that 81% of Republicans want strong, according to the Gallup poll, want stronger environmental laws and want them to strictly enforced. The, the White House has used all kinds of mechanisms to mask this radical agenda from the American people, uh, including Orwellian rhetoric. When they want to destroy the forest, they call it the Healthy Forest Act. When they want to destroy the air, they call it the Clear Skies Bill. But most insidiously, they have put polluters in charge of all the agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution. The head of the Forest Service is a timber industry lobbyist, Mark Ray, probably the most rapacious in history. The head of, uh, of public lands is a mining industry lobbyist, Stephen Grouse, who believes that public lands are unconstitutional. The head of the Air Division at EPA is a utility lobbyist, Jeffrey Homestead, who's represented nothing but the worst air polluters in America. President Bush uh, appointed to run Superfund, a woman whose last job was advising corporate polluters how to evade Superfund. Uh, he put a second command of EPA, a Monsanto lobbyist. And if you look throughout all the, the departments of government, the Department of, of, of Agriculture, Department of Energy, Department of Interior, EPA, and even the relevant divisions, the Justice Department, you'll see the same thing. It's the uh, lobbyists for the regulated industries, for the polluters who are now running the agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution. And there's nothing wrong with bringing business people into government. It's a good thing if the objective is to recruit competence and expertise. But in all of these cases I show in my book, these individuals have not entered government service to serve the public interest, but rather specifically to subvert the very laws that they're now charged with enforcing. And as a result of their actions, this administration's actions, there has been a tremendous diminution in quality of life in this country over the last four years. Mo Americans don't know about it because of the negligence and the ind indolence and the venality of the American press, which has totally let down uh, the American people and let down our democracy over the past, past several years. <laughs> 
and there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that, and I actually talk about that. I, I, I devote a chapter in my book to, to, to why the press has failed the American people. But they, they, the, even the newspapers, from which you can still glean some information, had, under this administration have become stenographers for the White House. The, uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post have had to apologize for their role in failing to ask the tough questions during the roll-up to the Iraq war. But nobody's uh, apologized yet for their failure to cover these environmental issues that are being absolutely, this, this government has mounted a jihad against the American environment and it's not being covered by the by newspapers. And the broadcast press is absolutely negligent. Uh, the, first of all, most of it the, uh, is controlled by right-wing media, the cable TV and, uh, and the uh, talk radio. And then the traditional corporate-owned broadcasters, uh, CNN, NBC, ABC, and CBS, since because of the abolishment of the Fairness Doctrine by Ronald Reagan in 1988 no longer have any obligation to serve the public interest. So their only obligation today is their shareholders. They no longer have to. They used to be under a legal obligation to inform the public about issues, public issues of, important, uh, of, of public import. They no longer have that obligation, and because of that, you have the news departments have become corporate profit centers. Their only obligation is to their shareholders, and they fulfill that obligation by increasing viewership and selling more advertising revenue. How do you do that? How do you increase viewership? Not by informing the public, but by entertaining them. And they do that you know, by appealing to the lowest common denominator, which is the prurient interest that all of us have in the reptilian core of our brain for sex and celebrity gossip. And, and so they give us Lacey Peterson and Michael Jackson and Kobe Bryant, and today, as a result, we are the best entertained and least informed people on the face of the earth. And, and, and the issues that are really impacting our lives, we're, we're blissfully ignorant of. The, the, the connection, you know, when people see a, a, an asthmatic kid breathing for air, they don't make the connection with this White House's policies and the money that they took from corporate polluters. Or, 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 and I, I'll give you a couple of examples about the profound diminution in quality of life in this country among millions and millions, most Americans, as a result, direct result. And I just use one industry, and I, in my book, I talk about all of these different industries, you know, corporate agriculture, and industrial meat farming, I, I, the nuclear power, chemical oil industry that have a chokehold on this administration, on Congress today, and that are altering these policies to the great detriment of the American public to benefit their own corporate prop. Uh, pocketbooks. I'll just give a couple examples just from one industry, which is coal burning power plants. I have three sons who have asthma. One out of every four black children in our cities now has asthma. We don't know why we're having this epidemic of pediatric asthma, which has quintupled in the last decades and doubled again over the last five years. Whether it's hormones in our food or pesticides or something is making our children come out of their mother's wombs with their immune systems haywire and with food allergies and asthma, which are connected. But we do know that asthma attacks are triggered primarily by bad air, ozone and particulates. And we know that the principal source of those materials in our atmosphere are 1,100 coal burning power plants who are burning coal illegally. It's been illegal for 15 years. They were supposed to have cleaned up, many of them did, 1,100 of them did not. The Clinton administration was prosecuting the worst 75 of those plants. But this industry, is an industry that gave $48 million to, the, to this president, to the Republican Party, during the 2000 cycle, and have given $58 million since. And one of the first things that the Bush administration did when it took power was to order the Justice Department and EPA to drop all those lawsuits. The top three enforcers at EPA, Sylvia Lawrence, Bruce Buckheit, and Eric Schaefer, all resigned their jobs in protest. And these are people who had been there for decades through the Reagan administration, Bush administration, and the chief enforcer uh, the, uh, for those cases in the Justice Department said that this had never happened before in American history, where a presidential candidate takes money from, uh, from criminals targeted for indictment and then, or already indicted, and then orders those indictments and cases dropped, investigations dropped when he achieves office. And you remember how you know, indignant the national press got when Bill Clinton pardoned Mark Rich during his last days uh, as presidency. But Mark Rich never killed anybody. And according to EPA, you can go to their website today, those plants killed, they, they, that, that single decision, the, crimi the criminal discharges just from those plants 
kill 18,000 Americans every single year. Uh, six times the number of people that were killed in the World Trade Center attack every single year. This should be on the headlines of every paper in this country every single day. But the press has ignored the issue. A few weeks ago, the EPA announced that in 19 states, it is now unsafe to eat any freshwater fish in the state because of mercury contamination. The mercury is coming from those same, largely, from those same 1,100 coal-burning power plants. In 48 states, at least some of the fish, or most of them, are now unsafe to eat from mercury. In fact, the only two states in which all the fish are still safe to eat are Alaska and Wyoming, where the Republican-controlled legislatures have refused to appropriate the money to test the fish. In all the other states, in all the other states, at least some, most, or all of the fish are now unsafe to eat from mercury contamination. We know a lot about mercury we didn't know 10 years ago. We know, for example, that one out of every six American women now has so much mercury in her womb that her children are at risk for a grim inventory of diseases, autism, blindness, mental retardation, heart, liver, and kidney disease. I have so much mercury in my body. I got my levels tested recently, and my levels are double the levels that are considered safe. I was told, just from eating fish, I was told by Dr. David Carpenter, who's one of the national authorities on mercury contamination, that a woman with my levels of mercury in her blood would have children with cognitive impairment. I said to him, you mean might have? And he said, no, the science is very certain today. Her children would have cognitive impairment, brain damage. Probably, he estimated, a permanent IQ loss in those children of five to seven points. Today, there are 630,000 children born in America every single year who've been exposed to dangerous levels of mercury in their mother's wombs. The Clinton administration, recognizing the gravity of this national health epidemic, reclassified mercury as a hazardous pollutant under the Clean Air Act. That triggered a requirement that all of those companies remove 90% of the mercury within three and a half years. It would have cost them less than 1% of plant revenue. I, and there were four quick companies, technology companies, that were out there trying to sell them the technology that is used already in Massachusetts and all over Europe and all over the world. But this is the same industry that donated over $100 million to this White House. And although it would have been a great deal for the American people, it was still billions of dollars for the industry. And a few weeks ago, the White House announced that it was scrapping the Clinton era regs and substituting instead rules that were written by utility industry lobbyists that will require the industry to never have to clean up the mercury. The, the new regs say on their face that the mercury will have to be cleaned up, sell only 70% of it within 15 years, which by itself is outrageous. But in fact, the utility lobbyists who wrote these regs wove so many loopholes into their language that effectively the utilities will be able to challenge it forever and will never, ever have to remove that mercury. The law firm, incidentally, that wrote those new regulations is a law firm, and most of you understand that in our government, government attorneys in our form of democracy, it's usually government attorneys and scientists who write our new regulations, not private attorneys and lobbyists for industry. But this administration has invited industry lobbyists into the corridors of government to rewrite regulations that affect them. And in this case, these regulations were written by the law firm of Lathan and Watkins, which is one of the primary bottom feeder utility uh, uh, industry lobbyists. And, that, and the chief lobbyist, former chief lobbyist for that law firm, is an attorney called Jeffrey Homestead, who is now the head of the air division at EPA. I live about three hours south of the Adirondack Mountains, where I take my kids fishing and hunting and hiking and camping. This is the oldest protected wilderness on the face of the earth. The Adirondacks has protect, been protected as forever wild since 1888. We had a right, the American people, to believe that generations of American citizens would be able to enjoy those pristine lakes and those aboriginal, those boreal forests for hundreds of years without, uh, without disturbance. But today, one-fifth of the lakes in the Adirondacks are sterilized from acid rain, which is coming from those same 1,100 power plants and which has destroyed the forest cover on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia all the way up into northern Quebec. And this president has put the brakes on the statutory requirements that those companies clean up the sulfur dioxide that is causing that acid rain. And this year, directly as a result of that decision, the EPA announced that for the first time since the passage of the Clean Air Act, the sulfur dioxide levels in America's air have risen, not just a little, but 
dramatically by 4%. I was about a year ago, a year and a half ago in May, I flew over the coal fields of the Appalachians where of, of uh, West Virginia and Kentucky, where all of this coal is being mined, or most of it. And I saw something that if the American people could see it, there would be a revolution in this country because we are cutting down the Appalachian Mountains. We are these historic mountains that were the, were the, you know, the, the wandering places of Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett and are the sources of our values, our virtues, our characters of people. And we are cutting them down with these massive machines called drag lines that are 22 stories high, one machine, and it costs a half a billion dollars and practically dispenses with the need for human labor, which indeed is the point. I remember when my father was fighting strip mining in Appalachia back in the 60s, I remember a conversation I had with him in which he said, not only are they destroying the environment, but they are permanently impoverishing these communities because they're never going to be able to find any kind of economic activity on that barren land, those moonscapes that are created after they leave. Uh, but, and they're doing it to break the unions. And that's exactly what they've done. Back then, there was 114,000 unionized mine workers in West Virginia taking mine, taking coal out of tunnels in the ground. Today, there's only 11,000 miners left in the state. Almost none of them are unionized because strip miners aren't. And using these machines and 2,500 tons of dynamite that are exploded in West Virginia every day, they blast the tops off the mountains to get at the coal seams beneath. And then they take all that rock and debris and rubble and scrape it into the adjacent river valleys and bury the rivers there. By the time this president leaves office, we have, will have flattened an area of the Appalachians the size of Delaware. They have already buried 1,200 miles of America's rivers, streams, and creeks. And this is totally illegal. You cannot, in the United States of America, take rock and debris and rubble and dump it into a waterway without a Clean Water Act permit. And you could never get a permit to do such a thing. So we sued them. Uh, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth uh, brought a case, and we won in, in, uh, in federal court from a crusty old federal judge, Judge, judge Charles Hayden in West Virginia, who said the same thing I just said, this is totally illegal, you cannot do it. He enjoined all mountaintop mining. Two days from when we got that, that decision, the, after Peabody Coal met with the White House, the White House rewrote the Clean Water Act and changed the meaning of one word, the word fill, 30 years of statutory interpretation to eviscerate and tear the heart out of the Clean Water Act, which is the, 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 to make it legal now to dump rock and debris and rubble into any waterway in the United States without a Clean Water Act permit or, or any kind of solid waste. And this is what, you know, this is the issue that we're dealing with. We're living today in a science fiction nightmare where my children and the children of millions of other Americans who have asthmatic kids are being brought into a world where the air is too poisonous for them to breathe because somebody gave money to a politician. And where my children and the children of most Americans can no longer engage in the seminal, primal activity of American youth, which is to go fishing with their father and to come home and eat the fish because somebody gave money to a politician. And a few days after drop, dropping all those lawsuits against those new dog, against those uh, utilities that were putting the ozone and particulates in the air, the president rewrote the Clean Air Act, tore the heart and soul out of it, the, the most important provision, which was the new source rule, so that those utilities will never, ever have to clean up their ozone and particulates. And this is what we're dealing with today. This is not, you know, the White House has done a great job at the, the industry has done a great job at the polluting industry and their indentured servants on Capitol Hill have done a great job of marginalizing environmentalists over the past decade or so as radicals, as, as tree huggers, as pagans who worship trees and sacrifice people. But <laughs> there is nothing radical about clean air and clean water for our children. And we are not protecting nature. We are not protecting nature 
for the sake of the fishes and the birds, for nature's sake. We're protecting it because it's the infrastructure of our communities, the same as we would, we have to invest in telecommunications and road construction. It's the infrastructure of our communities. And if we want to meet our obligation as a generation and a civilization and a, and a nation, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment as the communities that our parents gave us, we've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the public lands and wildlife, which in enrich us, that, that connect us to our past, that provide context to our communities, that are the source of our values, our, our character as a people. And you know, if you talk to these people on Capitol Hill who are you know, promoting these kind of rollbacks, and this is what I spend a lot of my time doing, and, and you ask them, why are you doing this? What they invariably say is, well, the time has come in our nation's history where we have to choose between economic prosperity on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. And that is a false choice in 100% of the situations. Good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. If, if we want to measure the economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generations, and how it preserves the value of the assets of our communities. If, on the other hand, we want to do what they've been urging us to do on, on the White House, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy, but our children are going to pay for our joyride. And they're going to pay for it with denuded landscapes and poor health and huge cleanup costs that are going to amplify over time and that they will never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. And I want to say this. There is no stronger advocate for free market capitalism than myself. I believe that the free market is the most efficient and democratic way to distribute the goods of the land. And it's the best thing, the best thing that could happen in the environment is if we had true free market capitalism in this country. Because the, the marketplace uh, encourages uh, efficiency. And efficiency means the elimination of waste. And waste, of course, is pollution. And, and it also encourages us to properly value our natural resources. And it's the undervaluation of those resources that cause us to waste them or to, you know, to, uh, to, to cause environmental injury. But in a true free market economy, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. But what polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. It is always, always, always a subsidy. And you know, corporations are externalizing machines. They're constantly looking for ways to force somebody else to pay their production costs. It's not because they're bad, they're a good thing. They're the driving force behind our, our, our economy. They shouldn't, however, be running our government. And that's what the distinction that we have to make. Because if they do, they are going to plunder. And you know, this is what, and look, if you look at all pollution, it's always a subsidy. When those are coal burning, it's a theft of the public trust resources, the assets of the land. I live in New York State, and the Constitution of New York State, like the Constitution of California, says that the, the waterways and the fisheries belong to the people of the state. They don't belong to the governor or the corporations or the fisheries department. They belong to the people. Everybody has a right to use them. Nobody has a right to use them in a way that will diminish or injure their use and enjoyment by others. This is the law in all the states. It is ancient law. It goes back to Roman times, the Code of Justinian. It's in the Magna Carta. It's natural, God-given law, according to what legal scholars call it. It's called the public trust doctrine. Those things that are not susceptible to private ownership, but by their nature are part of the community, the commons, the public trust, belong to all the people and nobody can diminish them. Nobody has the right for their own uh, private interest to privatize them or diminish them. And what all pollution is, it's a way to privatize the commons, to steal from the public, to shift costs of production to the public. And you know, when those coal burning power plants put 
acid rain into the air and destroy the lakes and recreational facilities and the forests, you know, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Appalachians and elsewhere, when they put ozone and particulates into the air that causes 18,000 deaths a year, a million asthma attacks, a million lost work days, lost school days, when they put mercury into the water that steals the fish. I buy a, a fishing license every year in New York State for 30 bucks. And you know, the, the Constitution says the fish belong to me, but they don't anymore. They've been privatized by people, by coal burning power plants in the Ohio Valley. They've stolen them from me. And that's what, it, that's what all pollution is. Though they're imposing impacts on the rest of us that should, in a true free market economy, be reflected in the price of that company's product when it makes it in the marketplace. And all of the federal environmental laws were intended to restore free market capitalism in our country by forcing actors in the marketplace to pay the true cost of bringing their product to market. And what I do, I don't even consider myself you know, an environmentalist anymore. I work for Riverkeeper, and I want to stop and introduce two of the local Riverkeepers here, Leo Anderson, who, I mean, Leo O'Brien, who's the San Francisco Bay Keeper, and Linda uh, uh, Sheehan, who's here. Can you guys both wave? Yeah. And we'll, Who's the California? Linda's the California coast keeper. And what we do is we enforce the laws. We patrol these water bodies up and down California and all the other states. We have 135 river keepers. Then we go out, catch the polluters, and bring them to justice. We sue them under these federal laws. And you know, we're not even, we don't even consider ourselves an environmental movement anymore. We are free marketeers. We go out into the marketplace, we catch the cheaters, the polluters, and we say to them, we are going to force you to internalize your costs the same way that you internalize your profits. Because as long as somebody is cheating the free market, it distorts the whole marketplace. And none of us gets the, the advantages and the benefits of the efficiency and the democracy that the free market otherwise promises our country. And you know, we have to understand in this country that there is a huge difference between free market capitalism, which democratizes us, which makes us more efficient and prosperous, and the kind of corporate crony capitalism, which has been embraced by this White House, which is as antithetical to democracy and efficiency and prosperity in America as it is in Nigeria. Corporations don't want free markets, and they don't want democracy. They want profits. And the best way for them to get profits is to use our campaign finance system, which is just a system of legalized bribery, to capture control of government officials and then use those public officials to dismantle the marketplace, to give them monopoly control, and to allow them to privatize the commons, to steal from the public. And that's, what, you know, that's why we have pollution in this country. We have the best environmental laws. If they were enforced, we would not have pollution in this country. But they're not enforced because of the capacity of industry to corrupt the political system. And what you know, we have to understand is that the, you know, from, the, from the beginning of our national history, our greatest political leaders have warned the American people against the, against the excess of corporate power. Um, and, you know, Republicans and Democrats, Teddy Roosevelt said this country would never be destroyed by a foreign enemy like Osama bin Laden. He wasn't scared of people like that. But he, he warned that our democratic institutions would be subverted by malefactors of great wealth who would destroy them from within. Dwight Eisenhower, another Republican, during his most famous speech ever, warned Americans against the domination by the military-industrial complex. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, the greatest Republican in our history, during the height of the Civil War in 1863, said, I have the South in front of me, and I have the bankers behind me. And for my country, I fear the bankers more. And Franklin Roosevelt, during World War II, said that the domination of government by corporate power is the essence of fascism. And Benito Mussolini, who had an insider's view, <laughs> Mussolini had the same opinion. Mussolini said uh, that, that he complained that fascism should not be called fascism. It should be called corporatism, because it, it, it was the merger of state and corporate power. And we have to understand in our country that communism is the domination of business by government. And fascism is the domination of government by business. And what we need to do is walk that narrow, 
trail in between, which is free market capitalism and democracy, and keep corporate power at bay with our right hand, and keep government power at bay with our left. And this, you know, this administration has done a great job of, of saying to the American people that the big threat to your democracy and communities is government power. And it is ultimately a threat to democracy, too much government power. But the much larger threat has always been corporate power, and that's been recognized. And, and we've been warned again and again and again by our most visionary political leadership exactly about that. And as I said before, one of the first things that that uh, and you know and I don't I'm not saying that Dick Cheney is you know is Heinrich Himmler or, or or Goebbels and I don't want to be misinterpreted but but oppression and the erosion of civil rights are part of a continuum and we as a people need to be aware of every stage of that continuum so that we can guard ourselves against it and you know what what is what happens when corporations take control of government, the first thing and the only thing they do is plunder. That is their whole objective. And you know, we saw this during the fascism, fascist years in, in Europe in the 1920s and 30s when, and I remind people that Hitler and Mussolini were elected and Hitler was elected by the most educated people in a demo capitalist democracy, by the most educated people on the face of the earth. And when those leaders and, and Franco took power, the first thing they did is put industrialists in charge of the ministries. You know, Hitler was a was a was a right wing, you know, Christian fundamentalist fascist who has was absolutely and his group was absolutely off the radar, political radar screen. People considered them nuts and you know and I've completely incapable of ever, ever taking power but they made these unholy alliances with industry money that started pouring money into their movements and gave them a political foothold and when they when that took purchase and they got political power they paid back industry by putting the industrialists in charge of all of the ministries and what did they do they enriched themselves by uh, mounting small wars taking no bid contracts and privatizing the commons and this particular government is the government that we have here in this country today is a government of plunder and we all know how they took a 5.6 trillion dollar 10-year surplus bill clinton surplus and turned it in four years into a five trillion dollar deficit a 10.6 trillion dollar shift of wealth one of the largest shifts of wealth in the history of humankind from our national treasury from the people of the united states from future generations into the pockets of the wealthiest Americans and the very rich and their corporate paymasters. And we saw how they plundered the greatest asset that we had as a nation, which was the respect and love that we enjoyed among all the people of the earth. And I, you know, when I was a little boy, I traveled around this country with my uncle Jack Kennedy, and I traveled all over Europe with my father. I went to Czechoslovakia and Poland and Greece and Italy and England and Germany and France. And everywhere that we met, went, we were met by vast crowds of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands, people who loved America and just wanted to be near an American politician. And they, and, and they looked to us, they were starved for our leadership, for our moral authority. I, and, and they proudly named their streets after our president, so I, Washington and Jefferson and Jackson and Lincoln and Roosevelt and Kennedy. And I remember the day after 9-11 when the headline on Le Monde, which is the biggest newspaper in France, was, we are all Americans now. And it took us 230 years of visionary, disciplined leadership by Republican and Democratic presidents to build up those reservoirs of love and respect and moral authority around the globe. And in four short years, we have destroyed it all. We are today the most hated nation on earth. There are five and a half billion people around this planet that fear and despise the United States of America. And that, for me, is the bitterest pill to swallow. Because I saw in the faces of those vast crowds when I was a little boy the potential for America to exercise leadership for the good on this planet. And, you know, we are, are these wonderful, beautiful alliances that we built after World War II with the European nations. The, the respect that we had even from the moderate Islamic nations who looked to us still for moral authority despite their opposition of their peoples. And when there was a problem with the Israelis, the Palestinians, they came to Camp David to solve it. It's unthinkable today. And how uh, they've plundered 
the, the other great asset that we have in our country, which are, is our, 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 our public lands, the sacred places that make us so proud to be American, the air and water that belongs to our children, and the thing that most makes us proudest of all, which is American values, the values that this country represented to ourselves and to the rest of the world, the things that we were proud to pass and, and made us proud to call ourselves American. And this is a government. This is a government that represents itself as a government of values, but all of the values that they claim to embrace are just hollow facades that conceal the one value that they really consider worth fighting for, which is corporate profit taking. They say that they're conservatives, but they have torn the conserve out of conservatism. They say that they like the free market, but they despise free markets. What they really fight for is corporate welfare, capitalism for the poor, but socialism for the rich. They say that they like property rights. They say that they like property rights, but it's only when it's the right of a polluter to use his property to destroy his neighbor's property and to destroy the public property. They say that they like law and order, but that they're the first ones to let the corporate lawbreakers off the hook. They say that they like local control and states' rights, but it only, they only like those things when it means sweeping away the barriers or the obstacles to corporate profit-taking at the local level. And, you know, a few months ago when the Democratic legislature of this state and my cousin Arnold Schwarzenegger passed the, the toughest automobile emissions bill in 50 states, the, uh, because the people of California were not being protected by the federal law, and what happened, Detroit is now threatening to sue the state of California, and guess what? The federal government is threatening to, just, to join Detroit in that lawsuit against California. And I see that, and that's, you know, that's, that's people who claim to like states' rights. And I, I see this all the time in my work in West Virginia against the coal industry, when local people pass zoning ordinances to zone out Peabody Coal and Massey Coal. The first thing they hear from is Ted Olson and, the, you know, and corporate counsel saying, this is an interference with, with, uh, with uh, national commerce. And the same thing with the corporate hog farmers you know, down in, in, uh, in, in North Carolina when small farmers and local communities try to zone them out the federal government threatens to come in there and crush them. They don't want local control, and they don't want states' rights. They want corporate control. And they claim to embrace Christianity, but they have violated every one of the manifold mandates of the Christian faith, that we care for the environment, that we act as stewards toward the earth, and that we treat future generations with responsibility. And you know, I said earlier, I said earlier that we're not protecting the environment for the sake of the fishes and the birds. We're protecting it for our own sake because we recognize that nature enriches us. It enriches us economically, yes. It's the basis of our economy, and we ignore that at our peril. The economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, but it also enriches us aesthetically and recreationally and culturally and historically and spiritually. And human beings have other appetites besides money. And if we don't feed them, we're not going to grow up. We're not going to become the kind of beings that our Creator intended us to become. When we destroy nature, we diminish ourselves. We impoverish our children. We're not fighting to preserve these ancient forests in the Sierra Nevada that, you know, now, as a result of this administration, are going to triple logging in the Sierra Nevada or the, you know, or the Pacific Northwest, as Rush Limbaugh would say, for the sake of a spotted owl. We're preserving those forests because we believe the trees have more value to humanity standing than they would have if we cut them down. And I'm not fighting for the Hudson River for the sake, and Leo's not fighting for San Francisco Bay, and, and Linda's not fighting for the coast for the sake of the sturgeon or the salmon or the striped bass or the herring but because, or the anchovies, but because I believe my life will be richer and my children and my, my community will be richer if we live in a world where there are shad and sturgeon and stripers in the Hudson and where my children can see the little fishermen, traditional gear fishermen of the Hudson River that I have been fighting for their rights and representing them in courts for 21 years to preserve that industry that, you know, that is the oldest fishing industry in North America. It is a, a, using the same fishing methods that were taught by the Algonquin Indians, the original Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam, and many of my clients who are fishermen 
I'm, I, I come from generations of fishermen that go all the way back to Dutch colonial times, and I want my kids to be able to see those people, those men and women, out in the river on their small open boats with their ash poles and gill nets, and touch them when they come to shore to wait out the tides, to repair their nets, and in doing that, connect themselves to 350 years of New York State history and understand that they're part of something larger than themselves. They're part of a continuum. They're part of a community. I don't want my children to grow up in a world where there are no commercial fishermen left on the Hudson, where it's all Gordon Seafood and Unilever in 400-ton factory trawlers 100 miles offshore, strip mining the ocean with no interface with humanity, and where there are no family farmers left in America where it's all Smithfield and Cargill and premium standard farms raising animals in factories and treating both their animals and workers with unspeakable cruelty, and where we've lost touch with the seasons and the tides and the things that connect us to the 10,000 generations of human beings that were here before they were laptops and that connect us ultimately to God. And I don't believe that nature is God or that we ought to be worshiping it as God. But I do believe that it's the way that God communicates to us most forcefully. And God talks to human beings through many vectors, through each other, through organized religion, through the great books of those religions, through art and literature and music and poetry and, and film and architecture, but nowhere with such clarity and force and texture and detail and grace and joy as through creation. We don't know Michelangelo by reading his biography. We know him by looking at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And we know our creator best by immersing ourselves in creation, particularly in wilderness, which is the undiluted work of the creator. And you know, if you look at every religious tradition throughout the history of mankind, the central epiphany always occurs in the wilderness. Buddha had to go into the wilderness to experience nirvana and self-realization. Muhammad had to go to the wilderness of Mount Hera in 629 to climb to the summit in the middle of the night and wrestle an angel there to have the Quran squeezed out of him. Maha uh, Moses had to go to the wilderness of Mount Sinai for 40 days alone on the summit to get the commandments. The Jews had to spend 40 years wandering the wilderness in order to purge themselves the 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Christ had to go into the wilderness for 40 days to discover his divinity for the first time. His, his mentor was John the Baptist, a man who lived in a cave in the Jordan Valley and dressed in the skins of wild beasts and ate the honey locusts and the honey of wild bees. And all of Christ's parables were taken from nature. I am the vine, you are the branches, the mustard seed, the little swallows, the scattering the seeds on the fallow ground, the lilies of the field. He called himself a fisherman, a farmer, a vineyard keeper. A shepherd. The reason he did that, and it's the same reason all the Old Testament prophets and all the Quranic prophets did the same thing, and all of the Old Testament the Talmudic, Quranic prophets, all of them came out of the wilderness, and all of them were shepherds. And that daily connection to nature gave them a special access to the wisdom of the Almighty. But the reason they used those parables taken from nature, and that Christ did it, was because that's how they stayed in touch with the people. Christ was saying things that were revolutionary, that contradicted everything they had heard from the literate, sophisticated people of their time, and they would have dismissed him as a quack. But they were able to confirm the wisdom of his parables through their own observations of the fishes and the birds. And they were able to say, he's not telling us something new. He's simply illuminating something very, very old. Messages that were written into creation by the creator at the beginning of time. And we haven't been able to discern or decipher them until the prophets who immersed themselves in wilderness and learned the language of the wilderness came back into the cities and explained to us our own spirituality, our own values, and the source of those things that makes us human beings, that enriches our, our humanity. And, you know, the same is true in our country. Our values come from wilderness and nature. Frederick Jackson Turner, our greatest historian, said that American democracy came out of the wilderness. Uh, from the beginning of our national history, our greatest political leaders and philosophers and, and artists and, and cultural leaders and writers have been telling the American people, you don't have to be ashamed because you don't have the 1,500 years of culture that they have in Europe because you have this relationship to the land and particularly to wilderness 
And that's going to be the source of your values and virtues and characters are people. And you look at our literature, poetry, our art, the unifying theme is that nature is the critical defining element of American culture. This is where our spiritual values and our national values come from. And yet we have an administration that considers it, that, that tells us it's an administration of values. And it looks at these green landscapes and sees nothing but money. And, you know, you just wonder about this, about where, how they miss the point of America. And, you know, I, I have, I know Donald Rumsfeld, and he's been to my house, my mom's house for lunch, and I've, I've eaten with him, and he's a very charming and affable fellow, and very, very nice, uh, you know, one-to-one. -one. And I, if you're not Nabu Grab, uh, and, but if you, but, you know, I look at him in his suit, and see him on TV, and I know that he's had the best advantage of our country. He's been to our best schools, and been to our churches, and had you know been inculcated with American values. And then I see these memos that went back and forth between him and, and Roberto Gonzalez, now our Attorney General, and and uh, and and Paul Wolfkowitz about how permissible it is, how much we can torture people. Americans can torture people, and I, I just, I'm astounded, I, I, you know, that, that these people think that torture is an American family value, and I say, you know, how did they miss the point of America? How did they miss all the point of, of what makes us proud to be American? And I, sometimes I look at this administration, and I say, how did they get all these draft dodgers in one place? And I say... These chicken hawks, you know, and I, I uh, Paul Wolfkowitz and Richard Pearl and Dick Cheney and, and George Bush and, you know, all their pals, Tom DeLay, Dennis Hastert, Rush Limbaugh. And, you know, there's lots of people who dodged the draft during the Vietnam War and, you know, my mainly, and I know many of them, and may, mainly there are people who had moral qualms about the war and didn't want to fight in a war that they had, re they had re strong moral questions about, but not these people. They all liked the war. They just wanted somebody else to fight it. And, you know, the explanation to me is that they don't know what it is that makes America worth fighting for. You know, the only value that they understand about our country is corporate profit taking. And nobody would risk their lives in their, in their right mind for that value. But America is worth fighting for, and it's worth dying for. And uh, we all know that. And we know what makes it that way. And it's the value, and it's the land, it's the things that we're going to hand to our children. And Teddy Roosevelt said that, they, that the only thing more important than protecting the environment for a government is, to, is protecting itself from dissolution during times of war. That's the only thing. This is the principal role. And yet for this government, it's not even on the radar screen. They have completely lost touch with American values. And we know that America's worth fighting for. And it's time for all of us to get up and start, start fighting for it. Because we're not just fighting for America today, but the values and the, uh, the, the chances, the opportunities for democracy and prosperity that we pass down to our children. And I'll close with a proverb from the Lakota people that's been expropriated to some extent by the environmental movement, where they say, we didn't inherit this plan it from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And I would add to that that if we don't return to them, our children, something that is roughly the equivalent of what we received, that they'll have the right to ask us some very difficult questions. Thank you all very much for having me here, and thank you, Dick Goldman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not taking a few questions, it's taking a long time. If you want, yeah, that would be great.